great honor, great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and it's a dream come true to be in the World Congress on Endoscopic Surgery 3.0. When we started this uh, endoscopic surgery and when we met Professor Macchioni, Professor Presuti, Professor Tarabici, it was a great resistance initially, but then we have uh, survived, I would say like this. And this lecture is going to talk about a little bit of the physiology and what we can understand with endoscopes that can help us uh, during the surgery. I have nothing to disclosure. This is the website of the group, the WEGESS.org, which is maintained by Dr. Patel from Australia. And this is a QR code. Uh, they say that all my personal data is there, including my bank account. I think it's not true. But you can take a picture of this QR code and then you, you're going to be redirected to my YouTube channel so you can download all the movies on the presentations and all the historical movies that I show uh, everywhere. So, this is uh, Dr. Antonio Mario Balsalva's uh, monument in Bologna. And one of the angels that you think about is this one here that has a thermometer here and a loop. So, he was one of the first physiologists to understand the physiology, the pathophysiology of the things. But also he was a surgeon, you can see here the knife, but what kind of a surgeon? An ear surgeon, because you can see the cochlea, you can see the station tube here, you can see the ossicle. So he was one of the first ear surgeons, and because of his pioneer work, and because of his idea challenging uh, Hippocrates, and at the time was the main uh, uh, theories of ear disease, he could survive. And his ideas were best through Dr. Schwartz, from the Schwartz line, from autosclerosis. And Dr. Schwartz developed what we call today the mastoidectomy. All these steps that we have nowadays to do a side and safe and sound mastoidectomy. And this is one of the examples of Schwartz mastoidectomy. Uh, as you can see, no drills were allowed to be used, uh, no facial gut monitoring whatsoever, no microscopes, no endoscopes. No loops, just the bare eye in order to see things. And one of the most critical steps of the operation was to read uh, lower down the wall and read over the region of the geniculate ganglia. If you didn't do this step, the surgery would be considered to be incomplete. So, as we expect, this was a kind of a normal post-operative after this Schwartz mastoidectomy. And I think if you have this nowadays, a lawyer will be in your office the next hour, charging like a million dollars. But of course, we have survived and survived through the light. And this is Dr. Julius Lambert, which is considered to be the father of modern pathology, performing a septoplasty in office without endoscopes, without microscopes, just with the loop, with the light, cocaine, okay, estopical anesthetic. And of course, he would perform the surgery in a very fast way. No gloves whatsoever. He didn't believe in bacteria at the time. I think they didn't believe in bacteria at the time. Uh, and then he would do the surgery very fast without endoscopes, without image guidance system, without uh, surgery cells, surgery flow, uh, copulation, without fancy instrumentation to perform the surgery. And then at the end, no vacuum, just a towel, and then oh, next customer, please. So very fast. Very, very fast. But now we are here in Boston. And Boston is the home of the first public demonstration of anesthesia. We heard Dr. Kennedy talk about the evolution of anesthesia uh, uh, that reduced the death in 60, 60 percent. So, uh, as you, if you have a chance, please visit the Ether Dome, which is right next to the Massachusetts IMU Infirmary, and then you can see this uh, magical place where they took the first demonstration of general anesthesia with Ether. I was there. Uh, and this is the famous picture that you have there. You have the surgeon here, you have the patient, you have the Albert, you have the dentist, Thomas Green Morton. At that time, even anesthesiologists were not doctors. We still have the same problem. That the anesthesiologists are not doctors, you know. And my father is one of the anesthesiologists. He, he was there, see, in 1846. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this is one of the problems of endoscopic surgery because everyone can see the same thing that the surgeon, the main surgeon, is seeing with microscopes. Sometimes you can hide yourself, you can hide some steps. But with endoscopes, no. And this is my father here. This is me doing the surgery. This is an Argentinian a fellow, Fernando Pieta, is here. And uh, the problem is sometimes he wants to make uh, comments on the surgery. <laughs> and I cannot tell him to shut up because he's my father. So, but I was also there in 1846. But of course, we had game changes in ENT and in medical specialty. 
And that's a problem also. And I want you to reflect on this also. In every business, in every industry, whenever you include technology, you reduce the final cost of the product. For instance, if I have a car industry, if I put a robot to build the car, the car price will go down. But in medicine, every time I include a new technology, actually the price goes up. And for countries like Brazil, like developed countries in Latin America and throughout the world, this is not good because we struggle with money within, within our health systems. So endoscopic ear surgery is one of the few game changes in medicine nowadays that you actually reduce the final cost of medical care when we, you include the endoscope into the patients. And this also happened with sinus surgery. We heard an excellent talk by Professor Kennedy about the evolution from the eye to the microscopes to the endoscopes to combine approach to do combined approach at moidectomy. And I'm telling you what, I'm not that old, but I've seen microscopic sinus surgery and to do ethmoidectomy and to do uh, surgery in the sphenoid sinus is better than the endoscope because you have the second hand of the section. But to do frontal sinus and to do maxillary sinus is terrible because you cannot see anything because it's curved. And that's the problem within the microscope. You cannot curve the light, you cannot bend the light. If you Google and if you put that, you will see that actually there are more complications related to endoscopic sinus surgery when we compare to microscopic sinus surgery. So why do we do endoscopic sinus surgery? Because we can see better, we can understand better. And this is a video that I will show by Professor Kennedy. He is an excellent surgeon, very good, one of the best I've seen, but a terrible actor. So as you can see here, this is a movie of the American Academy trying to counsel the patient with, uh, of the risks of endoscopic sinus surgery. Because when we started endoscopic ear surgery, all my professors said, oh, you should not do endoscopic ear surgery because it's dangerous, you can have complications. And then I said, what kind of complications can I have? I said, you can dislocate the sigla chain. Okay, here, Professor Kennedy talks about the, 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 the girl as, Professor Kennedy, what would be the complications that I should expect from endoscopic sinus surgery? He said, oh, I can go into your eye and then you can be blind. I can go into your brain and then you can have a CSF leak and then you can meningitis and then you can die. I can go into a rapid artery and then you can die. And the patient, okay, let's do it. So I never understand what would be the consequences of it. But of course, we are here because of the works of many pioneers as Dr. Karabishi that has to fight a lot in the past and he's considered to be like the godfather of the this book. Yes, this is in his house in the wild. But we're going to talk about the principles. And one challenging boggling mind the idea that I have nowadays and I study very much on it, it what makes us humans? What makes us humans? What, what do we differ from the other animal species that we have on planet Earth? Some may say it's art. We have the ability to see art, to abstract things in our minds, to create stories. We have the ability to talk, and to develop stories and to write. We have the ability to have religion, to have a faith in something, to understand or to try to believe in something. And we have also the capability to listen to music, to understand music, and to see that music sometimes can be fine. But people can say, okay, that's all because of fire. Because when we started to cook the meat, our brain uh, had more blood because the blood didn't have to go to the intestines, and then we could develop our brain because of that. Some may say, no, it was because the instruments that we have, uh, that we develop to cut the meat, to, to understand things, but I'll say what makes us humans is the ability to talk. The simple ability to talk, which is not very simple. But in order to talk, you need to listen. And if you don't have a system that is designed to listen to the voice or to the sound produced to our, with the, our larynx, to the frequency, it wouldn't matter to talk. It wouldn't be an advance to talk. So we as humans, human sapiens, have been on planet Earth, and there are archaeological evidence on that, for the, at least two million years. But the ability to talk, and we have archaeological evidence on it, is only 50,000 years old. So when we talk about evolution, this is nothing. And more than that, we have now achieved the capability of understanding that eight genes related to the building of the external auditory canal, building of the cochlea, and building of the ossicles, have mutated, have signs of mutated over the last 2,000 years, which is nothing, nothing. 
when we talk about the old languages, that the proto language that developed into English, into Latin, into Portuguese, into Spanish, if we brought those guys from 2,000, 4,000 years ago to talk nowadays, we would probably don't understand what they were saying, not because we could not understand the, their words, but we could not understand their sound. The sound was different, the sound frequency was different. And that's because of this, that we can see a lot of different malformations. For instance, this is the cochlea of a fish, this is a cochlea of the reptile, this is the cochlea of the bird, this is the cochlea of a mammal. You see the posterior part of the ear, part which is uh, related to balance, stays related uh, unchanged. We have this from like millions, millions of years, which has been through a lot of evolutional struggle. The anterior part of the ear, the cochlea, the circular chain, uh, the external auditory canal, is new. We have seen eight genes have evolved in 2,000 years, which is nothing. That's why we see a lot of malformations in this anterior part of the ear, and we seldom see malformations in the posterior part of the ear. And what this implicates this with endoscopic ear surgery, or what does implicate this with the hearing, or what does implicate this with the surgery? Because Actually, as medical doctors, and I'm sorry that I'm going to say to this, most of the times we don't understand what we are doing. We just cut, we just drill, we just remove things. We are just like mechanics. We are not doctors. We are not thinking about the evolution of things and about the things that we have to see. See, these are archaeological <coughs> evidence that shows that our incas had to be evolved to a bigger shape in order to fit our hearing frequencies. The incus of the other species, the other mammals, the birds, the, the dogs, the cats, it's very small. Actually, there are some animals that don't have incus. They don't have, they only have minus and they only have sapis. And actually they hear better than us. They hear more frequencies than we hear. And if we think about the Neanderthals, which was the species that uh, lived together with the Homo sapiens in Europe, for instance, we see differences between the ossicles also. The minus, the incus, the stapes. And these differences are very, very important, and they can be very challenging to us in order to understand the physiology. And what is the physiology? What makes us here? We have here the middle ear. And what is the function of the middle ear? To amplificate and to transmit sound. That's it. That's the, 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 the main reason that we have the middle ear. But in order for this system to work, we have to have air inside the ear. Where does the air come from? And then you say, from the nose, because you have the station tube, when you open the station tube, the air goes inside and then it equalizes the pressure. Okay, that works for five minutes, but the mastoid doesn't generate enough air to fill and to equalize the system. So there's always a very small negative pressure. And why do we have to have this negative pressure? In order for the tympanic membrane to be very stretchy. Otherwise, the sound would not be transmitted in the best way possible. But when this pressure is so low, there is a sign here transmitted by the, the, the tensor tympani tendon to the muscle and to the nerves that makes the palatine uh, muscles make open the eustachian tube. When the eustachian tube opens, it instantly equalizes the system. But sometimes you have problems in the eustachian tube. Sometimes you have inflammatory problems in the nose cavity. Sometimes you have an uh, adenoid here. You have allergic rhinitis, and the eustachian tube doesn't function very well. So what would happen with the tympanic membrane with this negative pressure, which is uh, produced by the mastoid? The tympanic membrane would happen two things, or three things probably, would totally collapse, and we see this in patients. You would have a perforation, and perforation can be the finger of God, equalizing the pressure, but what's the problem of the perforation? Bacteria from the external auditory canal can go to the middle ear and colonize a stereo uh, region that should be sterile in a normal patient, and then you have infections, and then you can have a chronic superatitis media. Or you can have a retraction here because of the pressure, because of blockage here of the isthmus, and then you can have skin going inside, and you can have a retraction from the cholesterol. And this always bothered me. When you talk about cholestatoma, Alex told this, the first word that comes into your head, our head is mastoidectomy. But actually, if you think about all inflammatory disease, and we are here to treat inflammatory disease mostly, of the ear, they don't start at the mastoid. They happen to be in the mastoid sometimes, 
they start at the middle ear. So if you treat the middle ear, if you understand the physiology of the middle ear, probably you're going to treat the disease and not only remove the disease and not only drill the mastoid, not only destroy a system that otherwise can help you in the post operative and this is not new, this is not my concept or, or uh, the concept of the group. This is a concept of Dr. Tarun Paola from several years ago, but to see this with the microscope is very difficult. It's not impossible, but you have to remove a lot of bone in order to see. So to understand these concepts of the tympanic isthmus, which is like the osteomental complex of the middle ear, you say have the osteomental complex of the muscle science, you have the more osteomental complex of the middle ear, is to understand the key of endoscopic ear surgery or the key of ear surgery. So where is the tympanic isthmus or what is the tympanic isthmus? The tympanic isthmus is a region between the cochlear reform process, this is a left ear by the way, anterior, posterior, superior, and inferior, this is the malleus, this is the incus, this is the stapes, facial nerve, lateral canal. So the tympanic isthmus, which is the main ventilation route, the main ventilation communication between the station to the middle ear and the mastoid, is a region between the tympanic isthmus and the interstitial jaw. Sometimes when you have an acute infection, you can have edema, swelling here of this region, and you can have a blockage, a temporary blockage. But sometimes you can have a scar tissue, or a web, or a polycytoma closing here, and then you have two compartments, two cavities. And if you don't treat this isthmus, it's like doing a maxillary sinus surgery, removing the mucosa, but not treating the osteomental complex. So it's just understanding this thing that I declare myself the number one enemy of the Incas. So whenever you have the chance, take the Incas down. Because the Incas, our Incas is too big. Our Incas in 100 million years, and we can talk about this 100 million years from now, is going to be smaller, I guarantee you. Or even we will not have Incas, because the space that we have between the Incas and the, the, and the, the facial nerve in the tympanic isthmus is very, very small. So to understand this is to understand that we can have uh, surgeries in a more effective way when we talk about uh, success of the surgery, like for even tympanoplasties, you elevate, you check the isthmus, in this case the malleus is a little bit medialized and the tympanic isthmus is a little bit small, so we can open a little bit the isthmus uh, doing a small dichotomy, you can inspect all the way, uh, the tympanic cavity with the endoscope, and then you can create and you can wash inside the tympanic isthmus to guarantee that you are washing the mastoid. And this wash, you can wash with saline solution, but also with antibiotic solution, also with steroid solution. The ability of FES, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, is to create an environment, a good anatomical cavity for topic medication. In the middle ear, we cannot do this because we have to close the perforation, but we can wash with topical medication and try to treat that infection at a time. So we open the tensile fold and try to guarantee all the, the, the ventilation rules after putting uh, a graft, a cartilage graft in this case, without a lot of gel foam, because also gel foam can provoke inflammatory response that can close again these ventilation rules, uh, these blockages that you already opened. But of course, this does not happen with all the perforations, because if this would happen with all the perforations, all the perforations done with the microscope without looking at the tympanic isthmus would be a failure, and it's not. But in order to see this, we have to elevate the tympanic mental flap and to see the tympanic isthmus. And seeing the tympanic isthmus in this case was not blocked whatsoever, but in order to see, we have to elevate, and then uh, in this case, we didn't need to open anything. It was already open, and it was an other possible case of the tympanic uh, perforation in this patient, and we closed in the same way. So it's all about anatomy, as Professor McKeown told us. To understand the anatomy of the tympanic isthmus, this is an endoscopy from the eustachian tube to the mastoid. This is lateral, this is medial, this is superior, this is inferior. This is the cochlear reform process, this is the cochlear promontory, this is facial nerve, incus, malleus, tympanic membrane. This is the tympanic isthmus. Look at the size, very, very small because of the incus. Look, incus here, tympanic isthmus, anterior isthmus, which is closed by a tensile fold, and these are the ventilation pathways that we have uh, within the middle ear uh, through, through the mastoid. So to understand this is to understand the anatomy of the middle ear, which is the birthplace of most inflammatory disease that we have. So nowadays, in the past, we had the concept of, oh, what would be the limit of endoscopic insurgence? And we'd say, oh, the limit extends when the disease goes all the way to the lateral canal. I'll say there's no limit anymore. Because we have to think about also the biological compound of the disease. We as ENTs, we put the same disease 
under the same name. For instance, we all have seen here polyposis that sometimes you, you take like two, three polyps, the patient is fine. Sometimes you see polyposis, you do a draft three, the patient three months from the draft three is already full of polyps. So actually, there are two different diseases. We just call the same name, but they are two different because we don't understand the biological aspects of the disease. Cholestatoma is the same. There are at least two types of cholestatoma, infiltrative matrix cholestatoma and non-infiltrative matrix cholestatoma. When you have non-infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, if cholestatoma extends all the way to the mastoid tip, you can remove endoscopically, you just wash the cholestatoma, it will pop out from the mastoid. But on the other hand, if you have infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, this is not going to be possible. For instance, we remove this non-infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, and then after, we wash inside, and the other part of the cholesterol, which was all the way to the mastoid tip, is going to pop out. But on the other hand, if you have non-infiltrative, infiltrative matrix cholesterol, this is not possible. You have to drill, and sometimes you have to do a combined approach. So it's very much understandable what we should do uh, with the physiology and with the anatomy to try to understand the disease and to try to understand what makes us humans and what makes us surgeons. So nowadays I like to say that, that, that there's totally um, uh, microscopic air surgery, totally endoscopic air surgery, but of course uh, we can always have a good fight, but it's not a fight because we are ear surgeons, we are not surgeons of the tool, we are not endoscopic or microscopic surgeons. We are guys who try to understand the physiology to try to get the best, the best uh, healthcare to our patients. So this is uh, my final message uh, to you. Uh, there are some books here uh, that you can understand. And what makes us humans, for me at least, is the friendship that we have developed within the group from the first meetings, uh, to the presence of Dave, to the presence of everyone, from the first congress, to the second congress, to the fights, see, here with Professor Sana. Sometimes good, sometimes not good. But uh, this is what makes us human. So thank you very much for your, for your time. Thank you, Dave.